Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Great weather, great atmosphere. Uh, great to see some of my former students here. Today, I'm going to share some interdisciplinary research insights on the links between the corporate sector and the macroeconomy. I'm actually going to give you great treats, intellectual treats that arrive directly from cutting edge research that is currently done here, leading uh, area of uh, uh, innovation at uh, Berkeley Haas. Uh, and this treat relates to uh, the links between the corporate sector and the macroeconomy and the uh, stock market, as I'm going to describe. So I'll start with the introduction, then I'll explain uh, my approach in my analysis, which is research-based solutions for real-world problems. Then I will explain a bit about a new area that I am a founding father of, which I call macro accounting. Uh, and then I will provide examples of my analysis and how they impact the real world. I'm going to talk about four examples. The first example, it will show the benefits of new alternative data. Uh, the second analysis that I'm going to explain shows innovation in anticipating and reacting to future macroeconomic shocks. So this is a new way of thinking about the macroeconomy in particular is how aggregation of accounting numbers of profits across many firms can be an incrementally informative leading indicator for future GDP growth three quarters ahead, as well as for understanding turning points in the business cycles. The third analysis is an example that will show how we can identify predictable error on the part of guess whom? Not just like less than perhaps the biggest economic authority in the world, the chair of the Federal Reserve Board, Jerome Powell. Uh, in particular, uh, as I'm going to show you, we show that Jerome Powell kept making, and this is not in hindsight, this is we have done it over the last two and a half years, we have shown uh, consistently that Powell is making errors that are predictable in terms of his monetary decision communications. All his communication with detextual analysis, uh, as well as uh, regular communication conferences, FOMC meeting of the Federal Reserve Board, etc. And this allows anticipating changes in inflation rates, in the reaction to the inflation rates in terms of increase in interest rates, stock market valuation, and other effects on firms' performance. Then, the last example, we look at a, a project that identifies several major U.S. corporations where the executives do not disclose material inflation risk information and this violates the SEC specific requirement, there's a regulation, that the executive must disclose any risk factors, including uh, uh, risk that arise from inflation. But what we found, we did textual analysis on 10K financial statements, especially on item 1A that the SEC regulation relates to where executives need to disclose the risk, but textual analysis over the last about 15 years, 20 years, many companies, actually it's most of the companies highly exposed to inflation risk, 61% of them, and these are only major U.S. public corporations, they never even mentioned the word inflation or inflation-related words in the risk disclosure section in contrast to uh, SEC requirements. Then I will conclude. As for the introduction, broadly, I'm expert on corporate financial reporting 
as well as using innovation for anticipating and reacting to changes at the firm and the macro levels. More specifically, my expertise is in the linkages between the corporate financial reporting, capital markets, equity valuation, fintech, and macroeconomics. I have a PhD in uh, business from Stanford, as well as uh, MSc in statistics from the Stanford Statistics Department. I'm highly involved with the industry, executives, policymakers, and academics, such as uh, I'm also a professional macro forecaster for the uh, US uh, Federal Reserve. Uh, they have the server of professional forecasters. It's part of the Federal Reserve uh, Bank of Philadelphia. Uh, with respect to my analysis approach, so I'm focusing on research-based solutions for real-world problems. And let me give you an overview. If you look at like the projects, like in terms of research, articles, analysis by the industry, over the last 100 years, when there are corporations involved, the analysis usually is at the firm level. For example, one question can be, what is the stock price reaction when Meta announces its earnings? Uh, another question can be, how a good board of director of a corporation can help achieve better financial results? So the questions involve the firm level. Now, what inspired me since my early days at the PhD program is that I thought there is a missing part in this analysis. In particular, firms do not operate in a vacuum. Firms are part of the macroeconomy. They are either affected by the macroeconomy, and we can learn from firms about the macroeconomy. So this is a more holistic approach that I brought into the forefront uh, by looking at how the macroeconomy is connected to the firm. We cannot just like, look at isolation. So therefore, I am a founding father of this new research area that is called macro accounting because it uses the relationship between the macroeconomy and accounting of financial statement numbers as come from the corporate sector. An example of an analysis is about accounting earnings and GDP. And here, we use innovation in anticipating and reacting to future macroeconomic fluctuation. We all know how important is GDP. So here, if you think about future GDP forecast, how it is done usually, or mainly, there are like models that look at top down. They look at like solo residual approach or just like uh, graphs over time of GDP. The idea here is to say, what is GDP? GDP at the end of the day is the consumption of all of us. We drive the car, we buy gas, we buy food, we go, we get new cars, we go to the bank. So let's go to the DNA of the aggregation of our consumption behavior that is reflected in the corporate profits and then take these corporate profits that are filed in real time based on the requirement from the SEC. Every company needs to file its, its 10Q every quarter and 10K every year. So let's take this like, aggregation of results from the SEC that is widely, freely available on SEC Edgar website. Let's get the data, aggregate it. What does it mean aggregate? Take the profit of Meta and the profits like changes of Meta and Cisco and IBM and Airbnb and all the companies and then form an index. What is this index? We all know what is the NASDAQ or the S&P 500 index. What is it? This is like a value-weighted return of all the 500 largest U.S. firms. So think about it like now this is like the accounting-based index. 
Now we do the same index, but not with the stock returns, but rather based on the profits. And we do value-weighted profits changes every quarter. Now it turns out that this index has some very uh, innovative uh, and, and impressive uh, um, merits. The first merit is that this, is, this index is an incrementally useful tool for real-time macroeconomic prediction. Now again, I will abstract you from the model and, anal and you know the uh, research design and econometrics, and I will just like highlight to you the merit of this uh, uh, analysis. In particular, Delta X is just like the aggregate index based on, this is kind of the accounting equivalent to the S&P 500. Uh, so this is like the aggregate index. Now, what, what we see here is trying to predict future GDP growth up to uh, um, and using different variables. What are the different variables? So here the different variables are well-known economic indicators. So if we go to Wall Street Journal, Yahoo Finance, the conference board, there are well-known economic indicators. For example, we know that the term spread, the long-term return on the uh, treasury bonds minus the short-term T-bill, this predicts future, future uh, GDP growth. Actually, we hear about the inversion of the, um, of the uh, spread, so this comes from the spread. So we added like spread here. Also, there is the yield. What is this? This is like the treasury yield uh, rate that also there is a paper that shows that it is a well-known economic indicator it is used in the industry. Also, this is the return. This is the uh, stock market return also is a predictor of future GDP. So we say, okay, we know the well-known economic indicators, but can financial statement, granular data, financial statement performance help, this is why I'm saying incrementally, help predict future GDP incrementally to what we already know? And what we see is that the answer is yes. It is strongly uh, significant and can predict up to three quarters ahead. Now, there is another question. If the financial statement data can predict incrementally future GDP growth, do macro forecasters, the highest quality macro forecasters, like those, uh, this is known that the SPF, the Survey of Professional Forecasters, it's a well-known, good quality forecast of macroeconomic activity. So do forecasters fully take into account this, the earnings of corporations when they predict future GDP growth? So the way that to test it is to look at like future forecast errors of GDP growth. So GQ plus one, this is like the GDP, let's say, of next quarter. Suppose it is, let's say, 5%. This is the actual. Minus, this is the expectation based on the Fed SPF, Server of Professional Forecaster, of what would be, what we think will be. And this is the consensus forecast among all the uh, forecasters. They have about 37 forecasters. And then let's look at the error. The error, so if, we, if the actual was 5% and we thought it would be 4%, the error is 1%. So now, what we do is, let's try to predict the error of the Fed's forecast, and to the extent that we can predict the error, it means that the delta X or the accounting data can be informative incrementally to predict the future uh, GDP growth, and forecasters miss this information. And indeed, the answer is that Forecasters, let's look at the last column. The asterisk shows that this is significant. What we see here that forecasters, indeed, they take into account all the well-known economic indicator when they forecast future macroeconomic activity, except for delta X. So in other words, forecasters, 
that predict future recession, future macroeconomic activity, they do not take into account the wealth of information that is available from quarterly financial statements. Now, actually, this is consistent with anecdotal evidence. I went to uh, the Federal Reserve Board. They have the minutes of every Federal Open Market Committee and statement of the Fed and their discussion. And I did Control F for the word accounting. And you can see, like, there is no even single word that they use accounting. They just, and if you talk to a uh, forecaster, so we were very excited, actually, uh, that, that we found because it's really consistent with the uh, tendency of uh, forecasters and macroeconomists to not really use, and many of them don't even understand uh, the, uh, the details and the institutional feature of, uh, of uh, uh, the, the, the accounting data. Uh, so they ignore it, and this shows. So the takeaway here is that aggregate earnings index incrementally predicts GDP growth, and uh, forecasters at the Fed do not take this information into account. Now, um, how can this tool improve real business world decisions? So, for example, we can better understand the macroeconomy we can better understand recessions, expansion, for, and this can be helpful, for example, for inventory management, <clears throat> for managing accounts receivables, credit sales, deciding about the allowance for uncollectible account. We need to decide what percentage of our account receivable will be uncollected. If we know that the economy is going to, uh, to do bad, then we can anticipate this when it's going to recover. Any forward-looking information, as we all know, this is gold. This is worth like, uh, uh, a lot of uh, money for investors, for executives, for shareholders. So this is a look-ahead uh, information using this uh, innovation. Also determining like write-off, write-downs, impairments of various assets, decision about buying, selling stocks, uh, uh, mergers and acquisition activities, etc. Let me give you some examples. I think uh, there are questions like in the end. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, some example. So the first case study, this is the inventory management. This is from the financial statement quote uh, uh, of, of Cisco. Uh, uh, sorry, the quote is about the financial statement of Cisco. And it's Cisco quarterly financial statements reveal historically biggest inventory write-off of $2.25 billion due to underreacting to an imminent macro downturn. Instead, continuing to place big orders for communications, chips, optical laser, and boards from its suppliers. So, uh, better understanding of future macroeconomic activity can help with this inventory management. Another example, we all see there are like some recession fears here and there. We see episodes of spike in the VIX index or the fear index. That suddenly it spiked, then it went down. What this can, he can, can help us is, is it fundamental-based fear, or is it just like fear that is not really grounded in fundamentals? So we can investigate the aggregation of firm's fundamental performance of earnings to understand if there is really shock in terms of the profits of corporations, and then there are fears, then we know it's more grounded. But I've, I've, I'm tracking it like every day, the stock market and the VIX, uh, I would say 100 times a day even. Uh, uh, and, and I can see, you know, you, we have episodes, a lot of this is just like manipulation of the market, uh, news that are releasing, different people coming up with like different ideas. Here we have a strong orthogonal signal to all these like news, uh, you know, articles to know whether there is like some merit to these fears or not. And I based my own decision on this and also help other uh, based decision on, on, um, on this uh, fundamental performance. Another, another application, let, let's go back to uh, the Great Recession, the, the big uh, recent recession that we experienced around the 2007, 8. 
Uh, so this is the S&P 500 index. It went from about like 1,450, and then this is the collapse of Lehman Brothers in August 2008. Now, what's striking, if you look at the index of aggregate earnings, uh, already we can see several quarters before the collapse in the market, in the stock market, that there are substantial drops in the index of earnings, mainly driven, if you remember back then, by the mark-to-market of a lot of mortgage-backed securities that were extensive on banks' financial statements, uh, and they needed to mark to market because of accounting rules. But back then, they were called like toxic assets that, com that banks needed to mark them down. I remember like Citi uh, and other banks, they had just like portfolio of mortgage-backed security with underlying assets of like streets or cities in Vegas, in Stockton, in, uh, around the United States. But they needed to mark them down and down and down, even up to like zero value. So it started from the banks, and then the banks together with the capital regulatory requirements, Basel I, Basel II, Basel III, the bank could not provide liquidity to the market. Then it started to spread into the entire economy. So all of this, this is like we're talking in August with Lehman Brothers until the market gets it. We can already see it like what is happening here already like several quarters before that. And again, this information has a lot of worse on a wide array of uh, executive decision making. Uh, another real world application of uh, this issue uh, related to uh, US Federal Reserve, as I mentioned, I was appointed as a professional macro forecaster, and I use uh, this research insights uh, with my uh, forecast. Uh, I'm responsible for preparing long and short term economic forecasts of various macroeconomic metrics like inflation and GDP. And uh, analysis shows that forecasts using accounting data can be the consensus forecast coming from research department. So this is like, as, as I showed you in the previous uh, table, uh, uh, these forecasts that, that we're beating, they're coming from, these are like big research departments of Morgan Stanley, Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, as well as uh, brokerage houses and other economic research institution like Mark Zandi from Moody's Analytics is one of the forecasters. Uh, now, uh, the predictive model that I use now, they use automation in collecting financial data at the daily level. So for example, my program crawls and analyzes big data sets of all corporate publicly available information provided as required by the SEC. And this index is just like every company, let's say today Airbnb, file its financial statement, my crawler catches all its information, get it into the index, so I can see in real time, and this, this requires a password. If you want, you can ask me, I'll give you the, the password for that, but I have the index in real time that I can see where the economy is heading. Everyone is fearful. Is it like, what's the situation? So it's not like 100%. There are things that we cannot predict, like if there is a big war or there is a COVID, or something like major disaster, we cannot predict it like, you know, in advance. But when it starts to like having like structural issues with companies that come through the profits of companies, then we can see it like in real time and it is very useful. The, the third analysis to provide as an example uh, is predictable errors in monetary policy. So it allows anticipating changes in inflation rates, interest rates, stock market valuation, and other effects on firm performance. So here, this is like directly from the paper I want to read to you. This is from the abstract. Um, however, despite the high economic uncertainty during the two years following the coronavirus pandemic shock, the chair of the Federal Reserve Board repeatedly and incorrectly portrayed inflation as transitory and short-lived with high confidence. This paper is with, uh, with uh, two of my colleagues, Don Moore and Biwen Zhang, and we just uh, actually started to, dis to uh, disseminate this paper. I want to show you a few uh, interesting features here. So theory, anecdotal evidence, and practical experience at the Fed suggest that macroeconomic forecast errors are substantial during uncertain periods. So, maybe I will leave this and explain to you just like in plain words. 
I've been working with this like, forecast error in the Fed for some time. There is a very interesting pattern. And you can go to the, to the Fed website. They provide the forecast. So, for example, if we say now inflation next uh, month or next quarter is going to be, let's say, like 6%. This is our forecast. And the Fed provides this forecast. And actually, this is the research staff. It's called their Green Book forecast. This is the research staff of the Federal Reserve provide this forecast to Powell before Powell make any uh, uh, announcement and communication to the public and decide about the monetary policy decisions. So we look at the data that is fed from Powell's people directly to him, and we look at it over the last several decades. And you see a very interesting pattern. When you look at the errors, which is the actual, let's say inflation was actual 6%, and the Fed forecasted it to be 4%. So this, is say, this means that forecast error is 2%. Now, if you plot it on a time series over the last like four, five, six decades, there is something very interesting. Every time that there is high macroeconomic uncertainty, the forecast errors spike to the roof. Whenever there is no economic uncertainty, it's almost zero. In other words, under no economic uncertainty, we are pretty good in forecasting what will happen with inflation, also with GDP, it shows the same pattern. But when the economy is uncertain, the forecasts don't worth anything, actually. They are so high that the error is so high. Okay, so this is like one observation about the time series properties of forecast error data. Now, how is it related to Powell? Let's go now to March 2020. We know COVID started in the world. It hit in the U.S. market in, uh, in March 2020. Uh, there was a spike, historical, one of the biggest spike of economic uncertainty. And we know during this spike, as I just told you, you see time series property, it's, it's impossible to know what inflation will be. So then, when this heat, actually, the COVID heat, the inflation was even below, slightly below 2%, as far as I remember, but inflation started to go up after that. So we're talking to 2.5%, 3%, 3.5%, 4% inflation, and all of this, just like, let's go back to this, like, COVID period, there were a lot of, like, fiscal policies and monetary policies of pouring money into the economy. The government poured trillions of dollars. The Federal Reserve immediately, re, re, uh, the interest rate were, were zero. And we know that when the money supply is high, then it's more likely they start inflationary pressures. It's more likely to have inflation. Not only that, we have also a lot of uh, problem with the supply chain on the supply side. So all of these created a lot of inflationary pressures. And inflation is rising and keep rising, 3%, 3.5%, 4%. And then Powell communication, we tracked all, all his communications about inflation during his entire tenure at the Fed. And we did textual analysis of his like, statement. And Powell came and said, like, 3% inflation. He said, it's transitory, it's short-lived, no problem. 3.5%. Short leave, no problem. 4%, no problem. Transitory short leave. 4.5%, 5%, 5.5%, 6%. He continues. It's, this is like predictable error, and this is not in hindsight. I'm so happy about this because we pre registered the data. We have a timestamp that we said all of this all along, way before he changed his narrative. When did he change his narrative? It was, and you can Google it to, to, to verify everything that I say. It was November 29, 2021. He actually had a press release to say, I'm omitting the word transitory from future, uh, future communication. And he started to increase the interest rate when? March 2022. This is when the interest rate started to increase substantially. 
Now, what's the problem with it? When you act slower to inflation, then the genie starts to get out of the bottle. It's much more damaging to the economy. Now we see what is happening. They, they need to increase interest rates so much. A lot of companies get hit. Banks are starting now to get hit because they have this, like, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, mortgage-backed securities that even are held to maturity for long term, but they have uh, unrealized losses that are so high, like in Silicon Valley Bank, the, the $15 billion of unrealized loss only in Silicon Valley Bank, and then they need to sell it because also it starts changing the behavior in terms of the deposit versus of, of the people, uh, of the clients of the bank versus like the withdrawal. And it starts creating like damaging effects throughout the economy, especially like in the, in the tech sector. Now we're experiencing it. And there are many other, now we predict like recession, etc. So the genie is got out of the battle and Powell took so long to act until March 2022. And again, this is not in hindsight. We registered the, this uh, data and analysis and hypothesis way before Powell changed his narrative in November 29, 2021. So this is just like all of this uh, explained in uh, plain words. And I want to show you some highlights from the, uh, from the findings. Is like the first finding, it shows that this is the CPI forecast errors and macro uncertainty, which shows that the point that the higher the macroeconomic uncertainty, the higher the errors. Then we can see it also here. For example, the green lines, these are the CPI forecast errors, and then the red lines are the macro uncertainty. This is based on total macro uncertainty. This is economic macro uncertainty. What we can see that whenever the macro uncertainty is high, this error tends to increase. We can also see it from here. That on the right hand side, these are periods of high uncertainty, and these are periods of low uncertainty. We see that the forecast errors are substantially higher during high uncertainty. And it makes sense. We don't know what we don't know. When there is high uncertainty, it's hard to know where we're heading to. The same with GDP growth forecast error. The same pattern also. We don't know what we don't know. But Powell knew, in particular, in this finding, it shows the Fed's confidence and total macro uncertainty. So we extracted, using textual analysis, how Powell was confident about the fact that inflation is transitory. And we can see this is the Fed, there are reserves, this is like Powell's statement, how confident he is. And you could look at this confidence. He started to be like no confident that, that, uh, that it's uh, transitory, you know, as uh, too late when the inflation is already like got uh, risen quite, uh, quite high. Overall, the summary and conclusion are that, first, historically, CPI forecast errors tend to spike during high economic uncertainty. Two, Fed chair's inflation communications are predictably wrong. The Fed chair is overconfident that inflation is temporary. During the uncertain period of the past two years post the shock of COVID-19, even though history shows that inflation is unpredictable, the Fed Chair public communication until November 29, 2021, where that inflation is temporary, or how he says it, like transitory. Uh, implications for Fed Chair being predictably wrong. So this led to unsuitable monetary policy to combat inflation, uh, results in severe damages to capital markets, firms, and the macroeconomy. The conclusions are that public communication and monetary policy of the Federal Reserve should fully incorporate systematic historical pattern, patterns where forecast errors are substantial during uncertain periods. Also, in future uncertain periods, such as future wars, if we have future war, recession, stock market crashes, pandemic, the Fed should recognize its inability to accurately predict macro constructs 
and thus to communicate and establish. This has a lot of very, very important implications for uh, standard setters, for policymakers. The lack of fully responding to time series of historical data, we can learn from history. The history repeats itself. We see it in the forecast error. Why not use it? Uh, so its inability to accurately, this is for future like Fed boards, uh, uh, predict macro construct, and therefore to communicate and establish monetary policy that are not overconfident and does not bet on certain prediction. So the takeaway for executives from this is better understanding of future inflation can help with a wide array of operating, investing, and financial decisions. For example, as an executive or manager or investors, if we know that the Fed is making predictable errors, and then we can move our investments because we know if inflation is rising, then your interest rate will need to rise. Then the market will crash. So the investment in the market should be uh, done in more uh, uh, wisely. Also, the companies that will be affected are especially growth companies that are highly sensitive to this rate of cost of capital effects that rise uh, in lockstep when the Fed increases the, uh, the interest rate. Finally, the last uh, example of analysis is undisclosed material inflation risk. So this paper shows that while inflation has caused trillions of dollars in shareholders' stock price losses, executives violate the SEC requirement to disclose inflation risk in firms 10K, as I mentioned. And in particular, I want to highlight a few things. And again, I abstract you from the design and uh, you know, econometric issues. I just want to give you like the highlights. What is the highlight? Look at that. that Exposed firms, these are only major, big U.S. corporations that are publicly traded. So when we look at like exposed firm to high inflation risk, we have 1,114 firms. Out of these, disclosing, these are companies that when we did textual analysis on all the risk factor where they need to disclose it, they didn't mention the word inflation, uh, or related phrases even once. Uh, so only 39%, which means that 61% never during our sample periods uh, mentioned, which is 15 years, never mentioned the word even inflation in the financial statements. Another highlight is that once a company gets sued using a securities class action lawsuit, the behavior of executives change. In particular, immediately after getting sued, we can see that those companies that are exposed to inflation risk, they immediately start to disclose this risk. They put it in the disclosure section in item 1A of uh, firm's 10K. Now, all the firms, it's something very interesting, after class action lawsuit, all the firms, they increase the length of their overall risk disclosure. They start putting like kind of like more, boiler pro, more boilerplate uh, uh, risk factors just like to cover their uh, liability. But uh, only those that are exposed, they, are, um, they start also to disclose inflation risk. And another thing that we did is this analysis look at value destruction analysis. This is in billions of dollars. In other words, when we did this, this is the analysis, it was about a year and a half ago. We say, what if inflation will rise over the next three years by this level of annual rates? What will happen to those companies that are exposed especially to inflation risk, but they never warn their shareholders even once over 15 years that they are exposed to inflation risk? What will happen, what will be the value destruction to investors. And we find, for example, in this case, that uh, let's take like over three years, the 6%. So this is 2,812. Now this is 2,000 in billions. So this means like $2.8 trillion in total loss for all the exposed, non-disclosing firms in terms of 
share price drop losses. Overall, the takeaways are that inflation caused trillions of dollars in shareholder damages and is expected to do so if it continues. Also, that hundreds of major U.S. public corporations are exposed to inflation risk but never disclose it in their 10Ks per the SEC regulations. But firms tend to disclose inflation risk after being hit with a securities class action lawsuit. And this paper now is, uh, got uh, published in a journal of uh, monetary economics, by the way. And um, uh, the conclusion overall is that there are major insights from investigating the connection between the corporate sector and the macroeconomy. Uh, recall the benefits of taking a holistic approach using macro accounting analysis. In the business world, executives fail to fully anticipate macroeconomic changes and to react accordingly. And we see many cases of these on a frequent basis. And it makes sense because like executives, they are dealing with the company on an ongoing basis, step by step. There are so many issues at the firm level. So now anticipating macroeconomic changes and thinking how the company will, will be affected. So this link has not been fully done yet, but there is a very great like, low-hanging fruit for manager to benefit their companies, their shareholders, by looking at the more holistic approach in the business world. Managing inflation and its effects on interest rates and firms is just one example. But executives can substantially benefit from adopting a research-based approach of better forecasting changes in the macro environment and how such, such changes will affect their firm. So this is uh, for today. And thank you very much. And I wish you a great rest of the time here. Yeah, it's good to see you, everyone.